Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the TDC's webinar this morning with Grant Works. Um, I'm Amy Swank, the COO of the Texas Economic Development Council. We also have Angela Self, who's our administrative assistant, as co host today. And of course, we have our presenters, uh, John Zakian and Julie Norman with Grant Works. Before we get started, I uh, just want to make a few quick announcements. Um, this is uh, set up as a Zoom meeting, so it can be more interactive, but we would like you to please stay um, muted. That way, uh, everyone can hear the presentation from the presenters, and it'll just be less disruptive. As you know, a lot of you, you know, there's ambient noises in the office with other conversations and phones ringing. So if you wouldn't mind, please stay muted. Uh, that would be very helpful. I am recording the webinar, and I, of, of course, um, GrantWorks is providing the slides. And so I can provide this to you uh, after the webinar today. If you would just email me, amy at texascdc.org, and I can send you a link to the recording um, and the slides or both. So if you would just email me afterward, then uh, I'd be happy to provide that. And please check out our other webinars. We have several uh, already teed up through the summer, about eight of them on the schedule already. So please consider looking at some of our others. And then hopefully, We'll see a lot of you next month in San Antonio for the TDC's winter meeting. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to John and Julie. And uh, as far as Q&A, we're gonna hold those to the end, but you can type your questions into the chat at any time. So if you have a question as we're going through the slides, please type them into the chat and then we'll address them at the end of the broadcast um, today. Okay, thank you very much. John, it's, it's uh, all yours. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you all for uh, signing up and attending this webinar. Uh, our goal is hopefully by the time we're done that you'll have more insight and um, knowledge to help you connect potential resources um, to projects and activities and programs um, that you want to advance uh, covering all types of economic development. I would want to reiterate that if you haven't signed up yet for the TEDC Winter Conference, February 21 to the 23rd in San Antonio, I would encourage you to do so. It is chock full of workshops and sessions that are very informative. Um, Julie and I will both be there so that if there's any follow-up after this conversation today um, and you want to have more detailed conversation, you'll be able to run into us and have further conversations. Um, I am John Zakian. I am a certified economic developer, proudly. I am senior vice president of program development for um, GrantWorks. Um, Dr. Julie Norman is also a certified economic developer. She is the associated, associate vice president of economic development for GrantWorks. GrantWorks set up an economic development unit uh, almost two years ago because it recognized that it is increasingly becoming an important element at the federal level, especially, but even at the state level in terms of grant programs and related initiatives. And it was important for us to establish subject matter experts in that specific field. I'll leave it to Julie to provide a little background um, about what she has done. Um, I have been in this field for 30 years. Um, especially in economic community and housing development. Um, Grant Works, just very briefly, um, has 400 subject matter expert full-time employees. Our primary focus is doing grant administration, both with state grants and federal grants. We will also support cities and counties and nonprofit corporations in, in identifying um, and doing applications. But our primary area of service is all elements of grant administration. Um, with that little background, uh, hopefully we're gonna take you through all of the ins and outs of what is involved with, especially at the federal grant level. And with that, Julie, I'll turn it over to you for the next slide. Thank you, John. And um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I too am a proud certified economic developer with 25 years experience at the state, regional, and local levels in West Virginia and South Carolina. And I joined GrantWorks in September. So let's just um, 
<clears throat> kick it off with first things first. Where do we go and what do we need to do to be able to apply for a grant? Some of you may already be familiar with grants.gov if you've ever searched for a federal grant or applied for one. But I think the process is worth covering uh, a little bit just in case it's been a while or if we have some folks new to the system. So grants.gov is the repository for all federal funding opportunities that allows applicants to both search and apply for those federal grants. It's fast and easy. Um, it's, it's simple, it's secure, and it's without paper. <laughs> you no longer have to research dozens of individual agency websites and navigate complex processes uh, because it's all in one place now on grants.gov. And the best feature, in my opinion, is the search capability. You can do a keyword search, let's say, you know, roads, water, industrial. You can do a search by category like business and commerce, housing, community development, transportation, and so forth. You can search by agency, eligible applicants. <clears throat> you know, some grants are only available to states, for example. So you want to search for grants that are available for your type of organization. You can search for the type of funding, a grant or a loan. And you can also save your search and have alerts sent to you, to your email, for any future grant opportunities. Now, when it comes to applying for a grant on grants.gov, um, they do excuse have... Excuse me, Julie. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, did you advance the slide? Because we're not seeing the slides advance. I'm so sorry. I'm so That's sorry. okay. There we go. No worry. Go, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. it. Thank I'll you. I'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, if when it comes time to actually apply for a grant on grants.gov, there are, there are downloadable and fillable forms. They have error checks and dedicated customer support. And everything is com complete and standardized for online submissions. You'll also be able to track your, your grant status uh, once you've submitted. However, keep in mind that there's typically over a thousand grant opportunities at any one time, <laughs> totaling over $500 billion annually. And so it can be a little daunting. Um, anybody can search for grants on grants.gov, but if you intend to apply, you have to create an account which requires a SAM.gov registration. SAM.gov is the system for award management and it establishes organizational authority to apply for funding for, for anybody that wants to do business with the federal government. So government entities, nonprofits, private businesses, and even individuals. And so what you'll get when you when you do a SAM.gov registration is a 12-digit unique entity identification number, a UEI number. And this replaces the old DUNS number that we used to use. And it's required for, for everybody. Um, now, it is free to register, but it may take 7 to 10 days to complete the registration, so plan accordingly. After you get the UEI number from SAM.gov, you go back to Grants.gov to continue the registration and set up your account. And you have to use the same email address. That's important. You have to use the same email address that was used with SAM.gov, but that person can delegate um, administrative roles to other people in your organization. And SAM registration does have to be renewed annually. Now, a little bit about the Federal Register. Uh, this is where all your the rules and regulations associated with funding opportunities is going to be housed. They're posted there um, by the funding agency. And so when you're reading through a notice of funding opportunity, a NOFO, you might see a reference or a citation to the Federal Register. And this is, this is real handy because you'll want to go there to read all the specific rules and regulations before you get too deep into the application process. Some other places that you can go to search for grants are foundations and corporate philanthropies. Um, you know, think Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Ford Foundation, Kellogg, Mellon, Rockefeller, um, even United Way or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Grantwatch.com is a good place to search for these kinds of funders, but there's only... There's over 28,000 <laughs> grants in their database, so you'll want to do a keyword search, and I think that requires a paid subscription. 
when it comes to the the federal state agency websites there you will also see grant opportunities and who's eligible to apply but and it's a really good place to understand the agency's um, mission and 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 priorities for different kinds of funding. However, um, I will give a word of a word of caution here. Um, sometimes the grant opportunities on the website may not be currently available because agencies will often list every program that they administer, but that doesn't mean that funding is currently available. They may be out of money. Or they, even if there is no submission deadline, per se. So it's always a good idea to do a cross check with what you find on an agency's website, with what's on grant, um, grant.gov, uh, grants.gov, and the Federal Register. So, um, John, is there anything you'd like to add to that before we move on? Uh, sure. Thank you, Julie. Um, just a couple of other. Insights, um, Julie has given you a good overview of the primary starting sources. Um, insider trade secret, which really isn't that. Um, I regularly, first thing in the morning after I've had my third or fourth cup of coffee and my eyes are actually functioning, I will check grants.gov um, on, a, on a daily basis. It's not all that complicated. They also will allow you to limit the grant you're looking at. So you can, in effect, uh, go to grants.gov and check all the notice of funding opportunities that have been posted for one day, three days, a week. So um, it's something that I would encourage all of you on this call um, to regularly check. Federal Register, um, you can go to the Federal Register and you can sign up for email notices of particular federal agencies that you have interest in. So for instance, as an example, I am registered to get all of the notices of the Department of Commerce, especially um, the Economic Development Administration. I'm also registered to get all of the notices of the Department of Labor and HUD. Um, there are multiple other agencies I'm involved in, but those are the primary ones related to potential economic development resources. By registering, you actually get the notices a day ahead of when they're actually posted in the Federal Register, and you look like you're a genius and can impress the heck out of a lot of people um, by indicating that you know before it's public. So that's a little trade secret. Um, in terms of foundations and corporate philanthropies, you're not going to find in general um, that they will be a primary source for funding um, for your projects and activities and programs, but they could become an asset um, if, for instance, which most, and we'll get into this in a minute, which most federal agencies require, there is a match. Um, foundations and corporate philanthropies can be a tremendous potential resource to get the match necessary to get a federal grant. Um, with that, Julie, if you don't mind, you can move on to the next page. So now that you know the primary federal and state and local and nonprofit sources, um, one of the other key factors to keep in mind are the key federal laws. The Annual Appropriations Act. Now, um, all grant programs on an annual basis are funded primarily, with several exceptions, but are primarily funded through an annual budget bill, which is the Annual Appropriations Act. The fiscal year starts October 1st. Well, as you probably know, if you've been following the news, Congress does not yet have their act together and Congress has not yet approved an appropriations bill for the year that started October 1st, 2023, which of course, typical of Washington, D.C. is going to be confusing. It's for fiscal year 2024. So all the regular grant programs, such as the Economic Development Administration's Economic Adjustment Assistance Program and the Public Works Program that are the annual grant programs that are 
two of the most important for our activities in economic development. Currently, they have no funding. Um, and until and unless Congress does approve an annual budget, they will continue not to have funding. It is important, therefore, to keep track of what goes on at, in the news, because until and unless there is an appropriations bill passed, a lot of the annual well-established grant programs do not have any funding, and there will be no notices of funding opportunities. So it's important to keep track. Now, as soon as Congress does get its act together and an appropriations bill is passed and the president signs it, then all of a sudden there are going to be a probably a um, wealth of notice of funding opportunities pouring out through grants.gov that may be of interest to you. The two obvious most popular appropriations laws right now, which are special, are the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Bill, um, which is also known with the acronym IIJA, and also the Inflation Reduction Act. What is critical to understand with both of these laws is that they are for a limited period of time. And one of the um, typical of the news media, um, for instance, with the bipartisan infrastructure law, they called it the $1.3 trillion appropriation law with all kinds of grants. So everybody thought that immediately in 2022, there would be $1.3 trillion poured into grant programs into cities and counties and states. Well, the fact of the matter is it's a five-year program. So you have to divide 1.3 trillion by five. Now, the good news though, is that there are a number of competitive grant programs. And if anyone missed out on an opportunity in 22 or 23, there is gonna to continue to be um, opportunities to benefit from the bipartisan infrastructure law um, through 24, 25, 26, and in some cases, 27. Um, the challenge is going to be that, keep in mind that about half of this money can be accessed at the local level, but half of this money is going to the state level. The money that's going to states can be based on how the state individually decides can either be kept at the state level and funding their programs, or it can be channeled into communities, cities and counties. So as these annual appropriations become available with our notices of funding opportunity under grants.gov, it's important to track both the state ones and the local ones because there may be funding available that's coming through the state and the state decides to become a pass-through. I will tell you that from my experience, a lot of the funding that comes to Texas departments is being passed through to cities and counties through their own competitive grant program. So it's worth keeping track of. The Inflation Reduction Act has a three-year lifespan. So its grant programs are being rolled out last year, 23, this year, 24, and next year, 25. The primary focus of the grant programs is through the Environmental Protection Agency. So going back to the prior slide where Julie talked about tracking or looking at state and fe uh, federal agency websites, for Inflation Reduction Act, new competitive grant programs, it doesn't hurt to keep track under the Environmental Protection Agency because a lot of the money under the Inflation Reduction Act is going through EPA. The other thing to keep in mind, though, with the IRA is that a lot of the billions of dollars that were spoken about, um, this is one of those areas where don't get be misled or disappointed, but a lot of the funding in the IRA does not go through grants. It goes through tax credits. And to be frank, most of those tax credits are going directly to businesses and industry. But there are some competitive grant programs that will be worth keeping track of and that could be translated um, into funding for economic development related activities. Um, okay, Julie, we can move on to the next page. 
key federal agencies um, that are definitely worth tracking. We've already talked about a couple of these. There's the Department of Commerce, um, which includes the Economic Development Administration, which is the primary um, federal agency providing grants in support of economic development activities. It is not the only one, but it is the primary one. The other agencies that do have programs that may be um, of value are EPA, especially its Brownfields programs. I, I will tell you, this is a quick note, and this may be further on in the slides, but the EPA Brownfields program is for site assessment and site remediation but EPA does not have grant programs to develop sites that have been cleaned up that are known as brownfields. However, EDA, through their public works and their economic adjustment assistance programs, will fund projects on brownfield sites that have been cleaned up through an EPA cleanup grant. Housing and urban development, just, so under HUD, their Community Development Block Grant Program, um, which in the case of uh, Texas, if you're not an entitlement city or county, meaning that you do not get an annual Community Development Block Grant directly, Texas TDA, um, Texas Department of Agriculture, is a repository of what's known as a small cities community development block grant program, and they will annually make awards through a variety of programs. I, eligible activities under HUD, under the community development block grant program, include economic development activities. However, it is up to the individual recipients of the grants, whether it's a city or a county entitlement um, entity or the, a state, whether or not any of the funding goes to economic development. So in that case, especially with TDA, uh, it is worth checking out the TDA website and taking a look at their annual action plan. The annual action plan is the contract between the TDA and HUD outlining how they will spend their annual appropriation. Going back to the point I made about the Annual Appropriation Act, right now, the fiscal year 2024, we don't know what any state, city, or county is going to get because there is no annual appropriation yet. So for fiscal year 2024, no community development block grant funds have been appropriated or distributed to recipient cities, counties, and states. Department of Agriculture, believe it or not, is one of the best, in many areas, is one of the best kept secrets. The USDA has a robust series of business and economic development assistance programs. They also have community facilities programs. Now, the challenge with the Department of Agriculture, and generally their grant programs are limited to communities 20,000 or below, although there are some of their grant programs where it can be as high as 50,000 or below. But if you're a population above 50,000, there are no USDA programs. The difference between USDA and a lot of the other federal agencies is that most of the USDA programs are a combination grant and loan. So in most instances, depending on the demographics of the community and the size of the population, all of their programs, especially on the community facility side and the economic development side and business development side, are a combination grant and loan, and they usually run somewhere around 60 to 70 percent grant, 20 or 30 percent, 40 percent loan. I will tell you that loans do have to be paid back, but they're over a 40 year period and at their at interest rates of like two or three percent. Um, so it's it's worth considering. Um, Homeland Security is FEMA. Um, there are several FEMA programs, especially their mitigation programs, where there may be eligibility connected to economic development activities. However, it has to be connected to responding to or addressing potential disaster impact. 
Treasury has several programs. One of them is known as the CDFI Fund. The Redevelopment Financial Institution has about a thousand individual entities. They are either banks, um, nonprofit corporations, or credit unions. They will provide low interest loans to small businesses. It, any economic development strategy that involves helping small businesses, it is worthwhile identifying which CDFIs you have. They are eligible to receive up to a million and a half a year in annual grants to capitalize uh, what are known as non-traditional lending. They will do high risk lending. So if you're promoting a small business or entrepreneurial development program, it would be very advantageous to you to partner with CDFIs in your area. Okay, why don't we move on to the uh, next slide, Julie. Okay, so let's say you've found a great opportunity for your project, and maybe you think you've got a great project that's a perfect fit with this funding. When you go to write your application, and after you explain who you are and who you serve, you're going to need to describe why this project is important to them, <clears throat> meaning the people you serve, and explain clearly, you know, why this project needs to happen. What's the problem that has to be addressed? And what will happen if it's not addressed? Remember, the focus is not on what your organization needs, but the needs of those you serve. And, and how do you know it's a need? Uh, use data and statistics to prove the need is real. Pull from your plans, any studies you've had done, government databases to back up your claims. And, and what sort of evidence exists to prove that the community or those you're serving actually need or want your help? So provide letters of, of demand from businesses and other community stakeholders that can attest to what kind of impact this project would have. Who else is addressing this need? You know, are there alternatives? How are you different? These are questions you need to ask. You know, most most grant programs will offer the option of either a planning grant or an implementation grant. But even the planning grants require that there be a specific need and purpose um, that's connected to your local plans and the agency's um, investment priorities. So let's say you have a construction project in mind, water extension, roadway expansion, industrial building, whatever. If, if a construction project isn't truly shovel ready, you might want to consider a planning grant. So before beginning the application, you're going to you know, ask yourself, do you have a project that's 30% project design completed? Or do you have an engineer that's, that's already engaged that, that could complete 30% in the next 60 days or so? Because federally funded construction grants require that projects have your architects and engineers on the project from the start because they want to ensure that this is feasible, right? So you you may have somebody um, on staff who's qualified to fill this role, but if not, you'll need to put out an RFQ and go through that selection process. And, and that firm that's selected is going to be a key member of your team in both applying for and executing a, a construction project. Now, the question is, you know, do you have site control? Um, do you own the land? Is there a leasehold agreement? Do you have right-of-ways? All this will need to be documented. And if this is an economic development project, do you have letters of commitment from <clears throat> the businesses that will benefit you know, to hire or, or retain employees as a result of this project? Um, well, this is not a legally binding, you know, if, if they don't the number of jobs that they are committing to. I don't know of any instance where there's any repercussions. However, um, it is required for economic development projects under EDA. Um, other letters of support, also very helpful from stakeholders, community members, and so forth. And then there's matching funds. Most grants require a match, and you'll have to provide proof that that match is actually available for this project. Very, very rarely will a grantor fund 100% of the project. 
that's a misnomer. And because this is another way for them to ensure that there's local support uh, by requiring a match. And and almost always um, the match has to come from non-federal sources. And and sometimes, not always, it can be in-kind, meaning it's you can use the materials, services, space, utilities, equipment, even technical assistance that you're providing or that's donated by a non-federal third party. But again, it has to be specific for this project. Uh, most often, though, the match is a cash match. It's a direct project expense that you or a non-federal partner provides as your contribution to the project. You're also going to want to make sure that you pay careful attention to the types of entities that are eligible to apply for a specific grant. Um, if you're a city, make sure that cities are allowed to apply. They'll, they will list counties, cities, states, nonprofits, and, and others. Be aware of the, the other requirements that may be involved. For example, environmental. You may need to include a section of your application that addresses uh, the impact of a construction project on the local environment and, and maybe mitigation strategies. There's Davis-Bacon Act requirements of contractors and subcontractors to pay certain wages and, and benefits and overtime to, to the on-site workers on federally funded construction projects. So read read up and um, you know, look at the Federal Register, find all the, the details. Avoid trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. What we mean there is, you know, make sure your project is a good fit with the grant. Um, look at it from the perspective of the funding agency. Would this be a good investment? Pay attention to the minimum thresholds that might be required regarding low to moderate income, distressed areas, disaster affected. You have to be able to prove <laughs> that you, you meet those thresholds and you can do that with, with data and maps. Uh, make sure your project is consistent with your local policies and comprehensive plans, your goals, and so forth. You know, there's there's certainly pros that, that go along with getting a federal grant. You know, you, you can get lots of money, and, and once you have a grant, you're probably more likely to, to receive others in the future. And it's a good way to build your organization's visibility and credibility, but there are some cons or drawbacks that you'd want to consider. First of all, it's it's time-consuming research um, before you go to write the grant. You've got to have all your ducks in a row. And you're going to need a talented person experienced in grant writing or a, a firm like GrantWorks in order to have the best shot uh, of winning the grant because it's it's very competitive. It's fierce. And the success rate is low. <laughs> the success rate for all federal grants is around 20%. And there are strings attached to the money you receive. You can't do whatever you want to do with, with the funds. Um, you're going to be subject to compliance with federal statutory and regulatory requirements and policies. And you've got to do quarterly reports and, and performance outcomes and monitoring and auditing and closeouts. I often say that getting a grant is sometimes the easy part. <laughs> It's the administration of the grant that requires a lot of knowledge, expertise, and time, which is why funding agencies allow you to build in the cost of grant administration. Underline that. They allow you to build it in, into your project budget. And GrantWorks, for example, has been writing and administering grants for cities and counties and others for, for over 44 years. And we have dedicated project managers that can attest to the stringent requirements of federal grants. You know, we handle all the reporting and compliance matters to ensure you're audit proof because the last thing you want is to get a grant and then fall short in some regard or fail because you, you'll likely never get another one. <laughs> uh, so keep that in mind. Other, other things to remember that when you're writing the application is to focus not on your needs, but the needs of those you serve in the community and make sure it's aligned with the investment priorities of the funding agency. And those are usually listed pretty clearly. Um, look at your project and, and the application through the eyes of the funding agency. That's critical to success. And, you know, just, just remember that federal grants are public investments of our tax dollars. And, and we all want to see a good return on investment, right? 
Now, after you submit the application, it's going to be scored based on programmatic and, and financial reviews. Okay. But if your application does not meet. Julie, this is Amy again. Are we supposed to be on the next slide? I am so sorry. There we go. That's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. I think, I, think yeah. I went one too far. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay. Um, before this, you. This just, this just proves that we are definitely live. We're not AI. <laughs> and, and it's not taped. <laughs> and you know, people are paying attention. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Thank you. Um, the application review process, if, if you are, you know, it, it will go through several layers of review. But if your application um, does not meet all the basic minimum requirements to qualify, then it's likely going to be rejected and you'll never move on to the review phase. So, and if the funder, you know, if, if you are turned down, don't be discouraged. Uh, politely ask, you know, why you were turned down and what you can do to improve your chances next time. But some of the, the um, main reasons that applications are rejected and include that you don't meet the eligibility criteria, um, you're not aligned with the funder's investment priorities, or you're simply just not grant ready you're, it, or, or you're missing a, some vital information. So what does the, I did at that time. <laughs> um, let's see, no, I went back too far. Uh, what what does the grant application want from you? Okay, so while most federal um, grant applications require some some of the basic information is all going to be the same, but each agency does have its own terminology and requirements and and the way they like to see things. So before getting started, make sure you thoroughly read through the the NOFO um, for the specifics. For the specific grant you're pursuing and if there's a checklist print it out make sure you have a copy available for your own use and and be familiar with everything on it um, the, the application planning process is lengthy but it is critical when you're when you consider what the government's trying to achieve <laughs> through this uh, funding opportunity and and the competition that that you're probably going to face for this money so, so while the specific steps may vary depending on the type of grant you're applying for, the major components are developing your ideas, conducting your research, writing the narrative and all the, the support that needs to go into to it to, to describe your project, and then completing the application in grants.gov. So read through it thoroughly at least twice make notes don't assume or guess anything um if it's not clear or understandable ask questions you know all the grant programs offer the opportunity to to do that q a during the open period and sometimes there's webinars um where you can ask questions and figure out what exactly they're looking for and then there's the help center within grants.gov um, but as you're writing try to look at your application as though you're someone who will be reviewing and scoring it. A cardinal rule is don't ever provide more information than you're asked for. I see this a lot. No matter how much you'd love to share some ancillary information, don't do it <laughs> because it will only frustrate the re reviewers. Um, and be aware of, of space and word count and never go over the limit. I mean, I, I've actually seen, for example, you know, they may say, Submit a 10-page narrative with 12-point Times New Roman font, double-spaced with one-inch margins on eight and a half by 11 paper. And so if, if you submit an application that does not follow that, it's likely not going to be read. But make sure to answer every question and provide specific information as required. Use, use data. They love data. Back it up if you have it. Avoid um, gratuitous and self-praising language. Don't say our exemplary economic development team. And don't throw out quotes and, and things like that. If it's not necessary um, or required, leave it out. Focus on data, demographics, verifiable facts, um, and those grant priorities. You know, because 
if they can't figure out what your goal is, um, then you have a, a slim chance of, of getting getting funded. Um, it, you want to make sure that it's not poorly written or unclear. Your your objectives need to be front and center, and how you intend to achieve them. Um, and prove that this is a good investment. Always follow the rule of quality over quantity because reviewers are human and they don't want to read more than is necessary to produce a score. And regarding the budget, make sure your budget matches the project narrative and every expense is accounted for. You know, if you include equipment in your budget, Describe the type of equipment. List the unit price and the quantity of each piece of equipment. Don't just say computers um, or jigsaws or whatever it is. You know, it's it's tempting to think that all you need to do is convince these folks of the merit of your project. But here's a secret. Most of the projects that make it to the review phase are worthy of investment. Instead of focusing on convincing them that your project is the best, demonstrate that your project is a way for the, the agency to accomplish their mission because they've all, they all have a mission. They've all been given, um, they've been tasked by policymakers to accomplish some kind of public good. So make sure you understand that funding organization, its investment priorities, for the grant, its mission, and construct your application accordingly. So it, it's clear to them that, oh, this is a project that is aligned with us and we're going to look good in the end if we find this. Don? Thank you, Julie. A um, couple of quick items um, based on the excellent presentation that Julie gave. Um, first, um, do not ever sell yourself short when you're doing an application on making sure, and this is not a commercial for grant works, because in many cases, cities and counties and nonprofits, rightly so, decide they can handle grant administration. But one thing that we've been noticing in the past couple of years, don't give yourself short shrift uh, when you ask for funding, keep in mind that all federal grant programs allow for you to allocate funding for grant administration. A grant administration can include the environmental reviews, compliance with all the federal re regulations like Davis-Bacon labor standards. Always make sure that when you're putting together a budget for a project that you include sufficient funding for grant administration, there's no set guide but as a general practice, it is prudent and wise to take the total amount of the project and either put in five or six percent as additional funding for grant administration. Um, the other note quickly is that I know, unfortunately, in the world of and you probably all know this already, but in the world of state and federal grant programs and state and federal programs in general, they live and die by acronyms. And I know we've been throwing a lot of acronyms at you today. Um, this is like a segue into a little commercial for the TEDC Winter Conference. I would really encourage you to come to the Winter Conference. A lot of what we've been talking about today in different types of workshop sessions and special sessions that'll be at the conference, there'll be more information provided. And again, if you wanna have more extensive conversations, both Julie and I will be there and we can go into depth beyond the acronyms. Um, key alliances, so you're going to be in our currently in a competitive environment and key alliances oftentimes make or break the success of an application, uh, even, even more so than what's actually in the application itself, although what is in the application itself is important. So 
regional planning commissions, council of governments, and economic development districts are critically to be connected with. In Texas, they, I think in almost the entire state, it is COGS. Um, I will note that, for instance, for economic development administration grants, in order to be able to process your application and get it to the EDA, you need to have a letter of support from your COG. So it is always of value to be in good stead and have a good relationship wherever you're located with your council of government. They can also give you guidance and support when putting together your application for an economic development administration grant. To a lesser extent, but it's still there, they can also be helpful with USDA. Um, I would be remiss, and Amy would, would stop talking to me if I didn't put the next bullet in, but it is important. Always stay affiliated, if you can, with state and national professional organizations. One of the greatest values of TDC in representing the economic development profession in Texas is continually getting economic development um, present in the thinking of the state and even with the, among federal agencies. TDC has a great relationship with the Austin Regional Office of EDA. So there is extreme value in staying very active and involved with these types of organizations. And it also doesn't hurt to be connected with your elected representatives. Now, I will tell you that to a large extent, um, applications, especially competitive applications, are graded on merit at the federal agency levels. There are rules governing that. But it never hurts to have a good relationship with your elected officials, both at the state level and the federal level, whoever your congressional representative is, because they their staff can be of assistance in giving you insight and information as to what is, is really required of, for a grant application. The other key thing is that one of the strengths of any application is connecting it to existing plans. There are comprehensive economic development strategies. So every COG in Texas has a comprehensive economic development strategy. It's known as a SEDS. Again, if you're going to do an economic development administration grant, you need to be able to show that your project is consistent with the SEDS. It's on their website, and it's something worth getting very familiar with. If you're at the local level or if you're a city at the county level, if you have comprehensive growth plans, original transportation plans, it is always a value to be able to show, especially at the federal level, that your plans are consistent with those plans. It, it enhances and supports what you're doing. It's not, well, SEDS is an absolute requirement. Comprehensive growth plans and regional transportation plans are, can look, be looked at as more optional. But remember that you're in a highly competitive environment and there is extreme value in making sure you can connect them. The other key thing is to get to know your state and federal agency representatives. Surprisingly, a lot of federal agencies will have either state or even sub-state offices. So for instance, EDA is divided into regions. They have a, their regional office for this region is in Austin. And the state of Texas is divided, I think, into four with four economic development representatives. There is no harm in making contact and having conversations with the economic development representative in the Austin office that represents you. USDA has a wealth of local offices. If you have any interest in any of their business or economic development assistance grant programs or community facilities grant programs, it is always of value to identify and find the office nearest you and have a conversation with just to get familiar and make them aware of you and become visible to them. Um, again, in the bigger picture, it doesn't hurt to have a relationship with these federal representatives at the local level. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that many federal agencies themselves have direct links with similar state agencies, and therefore you can communicate to your state agencies in order to have a relationship established with the federal agencies. Julie, we can go on to the next page.
for some reason it's not advancing. <laughs> okay. Um, wow, well, one of those wonderful technical little glitches. Uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm hitting enter. I'm hitting the space bar. Um, let's see if I can do this. Well, yes. Well, let me do this. Um, again, anyone that would like all the slides, um, please reach out to Amy. I think Amy's at least once posted her um, email address and also uh, access this recording. So I'll just go ahead. And if you can figure it out, Julie, great. If not, I'll just wing it. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay, so picking up on what Julie said about grant review and scoring, um, a couple of things to keep in mind to reinforce what Julie shared with you. Um, many federal agencies are using outside individuals, meaning private practitioners, to review and score grant applications. For full disclosure, I am a grant reviewer for six different federal agencies covering about 12 different federal grant programs. It is not, I will tell you, um, a career that will be a full-time profession, but it can be helpful. It's given me tremendous insight um, and seeing both the trends and patterns that are going on, especially in economic development, but also getting an even clearer understanding of the rules and regulations that are required for the various grant programs, and also the thinking and mindset of federal agencies. So keep in mind that um, it is important that you adhere to whatever guidelines and rules are being presented for the grant because these outside reviewers, it's gonna be hammered into their brains that they need to stay within the boundaries and limits. And no matter how impressive a grant application may appear, if it doesn't fit precisely into the requirements of the grant program, it cannot be scored highly. The other thing to keep in mind, going back to a point that Julie said about quantity over quality, the experience and knowledge of a lot of these grant reviewers is varied. Some are really, really experts. Some are fledgling. It is therefore important that you treat, when you're writing an application for a grant program, that you treat it as if you're leading someone step by step by step. Don't assume they understand what you're proposing or saying. Make a clear, concise and precise within the requirements of the grant program and show how it is responding to the goals and objectives of the grant program. Putting together the application along those lines, budget must be consistent with the narrative and always make sure that every line item in the budget is clearly explained because that is an absolute requirement for grant reviewers. Be consistent throughout the narrative. Oftentimes, grants applications will not be approved because there is an inconsistency with the narrative in terms of talking about the community or talking about the project or the desired outcomes. If it takes one or two reviews of what you're doing, just make sure that everything is consistent throughout the application. Identify clearly the roles and responsibilities for administering the grant. One of the underlying questions that all federal grant agencies will look at is if we give this city or county or nonprofit or this economic development organization a grant, are we going to have a strong enough comfort level to believe that they will spend the money correctly? They will spend the money within the rules and they will spend the money on a timely basis based on the project. So it's very important to demonstrate. Now, there is nothing wrong with saying that you're going to either do it in-house and identify the people that are going to do it. If you do that, make sure you provide their experience and expertise 
And similarly, there is nothing wrong with saying that you're going to go outside and do and select someone with an RFP, or you may have already selected someone with an RFP, in which case specify, again, within space limits, specify their experience and expertise. Make sure, believe it or not, this happens a lot. Many applications, especially federal, federal applications, will require signatures in five or six different locations. Make sure, I mean, go again, go through it two or three or four times. Make sure every signature space is signed because I can't tell you the number of applications I've been reviewing where they were disallowed because a signature space was missed. Uh, it's not a death knell, but there is always value in proofreading, using spell check, um, but don't completely rely, rely on spell check because I painfully have learned that spell check sometimes will misinterpret the words you want to use. But although it is not a death knell to have an application submitted that either has poor phrasing or misspelled words, I will tell you that in a competitive environment where there's one application that is no mistakes and one application with some mistakes, almost inevitably the application with no mistakes is going to get the funding versus the application with mistakes. Um, one last thought. Um, going back again to what Julie was saying uh, in her presentations. If you have a really great project, but you know honestly and frankly that it doesn't dot all the I's and cross all the T's, there is nothing wrong because most federal grant programs do this. They give you a choice between project implementation and project planning. There is nothing wrong with going for a planning grant first, get all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed, and then in the following year, go for the implementation grant. The other thing to keep in mind is the worst mistake that can be made is trying to fit that square peg into a round hole. If the project you wanna get funded or the activity or program doesn't precisely fit within the rules and regulations and the goals of the grant program, it is not worth the time, effort, or money to make the application. It's not going to get funded. Um, it's just an unfortunate reality these days. I will tell you that um, typically um, for these competitive grant programs, um, on an average basis, for the amount of funding that's being made available, they're getting upwards of 200% to 300% over the amount of funding requested in total application value, just to give you a sense of how competitive these grant programs are. Julie, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, well, um, we've covered a lot, but based on you know everything that we've talked about so far and the time it takes to do all the research, and write a compelling grant application. Um, I'll just say it's it's never too soon to start searching. Get into that routine of, of regularly checking the various sites we've talked about. Um, don't wait until you have a project ready to roll out to start doing this. And and but if you do have a project, be patient. Wait for the right uh, grant opportunity. Keep an active list of all the things you, you're going to need for this project so that it comes together a little easier. Um, applications are typically open for somewhere between 30 and 90 days. So keep that in mind. And it's a good idea to, to know the history of recurring grant application timelines. Some programs... Um, open up at the same time every year. They're usually pretty consistent. So you might want to use that as a gauge on when you might uh, get started on, on putting things together. And also keep in mind that open-ended programs can, can still run out of money, you know? So we mentioned this earlier. And if you see an RFI, uh, that's usually a tip off that you're probably gonna see a grant grant application or NOFA come out um, 
150 days later. You know, back to the the open-ended uh, grant applications, you know, <laughs> do you know how many programs EDA actually operates? So the Economic Development Administration, on their website, they list 18, 18 different programs. How many funding opportunities are shown on their website to be open right now? That answer is six. But we know that there's that's not always going to be the, the case, that even though they're there, funding is currently not available for all six programs on EDA right now. Uh, I will say that... Uh, I think we may have lost Julie. Oh, um, yes, Julie. You're in on a, a webinar. Julie, make sure you have audio up. for a little while if you want to go back a little bit. Oh, can you hear me now? I can yes. now, but we, you were you were muted for our um, for a little bit. If you want to just back up, maybe a little bit to start where on this slide. Okay, um, I'm not sure how much you've heard because well, you, you know um, my audio went out. No, um, you, you you talked about don't wait until you have a project. Um, I think you got up as far as keep the active list of needs. Right, and applications are typically open 30 to 90 days. Um, if you happen to see a, a request for information or RFI, that's usually a tip off that a, a funding opportunity is gonna be coming down the pike. And with regard to open-ended grant applications, even though they may appear open um, and available on an agency's website, that doesn't actually mean there's currently money available. For example, EDA on their website has 18 different programs, 18 different programs they operate. Six programs are listed as um, funding opportunities that are available or open right now, but we know that that's not always accurate. You know, funding for all six of those programs listed as open um, doesn't actually exist. So take every opportunity to learn as much as you can and attend those webinar sessions if they're offered. I would strongly encourage you to include as many people on your team, your application team, as possible in the webinar so that you know, you can compare notes and, and make sure that everyone has the same understanding of what's required. And know that extensions are for applications are rarely granted. So pay attention to the timeline and submission deadlines, put it on your calendar, plan for it way in advance. And I would say, make your internal deadline at least several days earlier because you don't want to be rushing at the end. And also I've noticed that sometimes grants.gov gets really jammed up on the last day, the final day of submission. So I, I certainly wouldn't risk it. Um, I, I want to add, just add another comment to what John said earlier about the rating uh, of these applications you'll often find that actual scoring criteria and even the points associated with each category as part of the you know, application materials that come with the, the NOFO. So become very familiar with the, that so you'll know what they're really focusing on. Some things are more important than others and they're gonna be scored with a greater weight than others. So that's available with the application. Take a look at that. And finally, you know, missing a deadline, if, if you miss a, an opportunity, it's not the end of the world. There will certainly be other opportunities. So um, with that, I think we're ready to take some questions. Thank you, Julie and John. Um, there was a question already in the chat. If you can both look at the chat or I can just read it. It's from... Um, Chelsea Maldonado. John, can you see that? I see it, yeah. yeah. So um, 
Okay, so the question, it's a good question. Um, and it, it's, um, it's actually increasingly becoming a debatable issue. So the question is, um, if, you, if you procure a grant writer, um, the, the question has become, is there a conflict of interest or grant restriction that does not allow a client or group to, re, to use the grant research to be the grant writer? Um, I will tell you that the Bible for federal rules and regulations, and unless you've got a lot of coffee and a lot of time, uh, I wouldn't necessarily encourage you to read the whole statute, but the statute governing um, federal grants, especially procurement, is 2 CFR 200, Chapter 2. CFR 200. There is nothing in 2 CFR 200, which governs all federal grants, that precludes a city, a county, or a nonprofit from hiring a researcher and having that researcher then do the application. And then once the application is awarded to then do the grant administration. With that said, um, that's why it is so important to read the Notice of Funding Opportunities. There are some federal agencies that will, at their discretion, put in certain restrictions. As an example, the Economic Development Administration, under their Public Works Program for Engineering and Architectural Services, has a provision that says that if the engineer or architect is engaged, to do the initial 30% um, plans that's required to get an application approved for an infrastructure project. And that results in the RFP being done once a grant is approved to do the actual full design. They're conflicted out. Um, but that is the exception, not the rule. I would tell you as a general practice, um, and again, there is nothing in the federal 2 CFR 200 that prohibits this. There, as a general practice, there is nothing wrong with doing a complete procurement, meaning um, you can procure either for one of the three or all three, research, application, and grant administration. I will, this could be a whole webinar, by the way, Amy, just FYI, but I'll keep it short. So I will tell you that for the most part, grant research is a fledgling professional practice. Um, we generally do not do grant research unless it is connected to an engagement. We are now grant works. We are now looking at perhaps creating grant research as a service. But for the most part, grant research is really not, at this point, a really robust profession. Application writing is increasingly becoming a robust profession, but in itself is not fully um, developed yet either. Grant administration is a robust and highly competitive profession. But again, you can do one of the three, two of the three, three of the three, as long as whatever procurement you do is done consistent with the requirements of 2 CFR 200, um, there should be no problems. It was kind of a long answer, but um, are there any other questions? I do have two. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's Go ahead, Amy. Amy again, uh, um, while we're waiting and see if any more questions come in, I don't know if you if this is really a question or if you just have some advice or um, how you know most EDCs they're not uh, in Texas. You know, there's not they're not huge staffs, of course. Um, but do you have recommendations if you have on managing multiple grants for multiple agencies? Is that I mean, can you get in over your head if you're trying to do too many from too, too many different organizations or too many different types of entities? Amy, that's an excellent question. Um, 
there is a risk um, of taking on too many grants at the same time. Now, I, I, I will tell you that, again, it goes back to a point um, I made midway through. If you're going after, let's say you're going after an EDA grant, you're also going after a USDA grant, maybe even an EPA grant. Um, build into those grants. Again, there, there are no restrictions. Build into those grants an administrative amount of funding. And again, generally it ranges from 5 to 7% of what the total grant is. Now, if you get your grant approved, you can either use that funding to, you know, engage support that either manages the grant for you or complements the grant that staff, you may have some staff and what you need is supplemental. There may be certain aspects of a grant you don't have expertise in, and you can use that funding both to cover your staff costs and also supplemental costs. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, at the end of the day, you don't want to be taking on, even if you contract out grant administration, you don't want to take on too many projects at once because ultimate oversight still rests with the EDC. And even if you use consultant firms like GrantWorks, um, we, there are certain things under federal law that we can't do, especially in terms of making sure um, accountability is maintained with the grant funding source. We can support it and help it, but ultimately the EDC itself is on the hook for assuring accountability. Um, so part of a strategic plan or a part of a strategic discussion going forward is to map out on a timely basis um, how you want to proceed. What are your priority projects? The other thing to keep in mind, which Julie has mentioned several times, is that most of these programs that we've talked about today are annual programs. So if, for instance, in 2023, you miss an opportunity, you can get it in 2024. If you have three projects, one could be a 24, one could be a 25, one could be a 26. The high, the extremely highly likelihood those grant programs are still going to exist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I don't see any more questions in the chat right now. Um, is there any final comments that you'd like to wrap up, uh, John and Julie? Sure. I can offer two quick points. Um, if for some reason, you make an application or you've hired somebody to make an application and you don't get funded, don't be disappointed and absolutely reach out to the federal agency and ask them why you didn't get funded. Increasingly, um, Congress is requiring federal agencies to share information with applicants that don't get funded as to why they didn't get funded. And in fact, there is a strategy in you doing that because you have a likely chance of showing them your interest and in hearing their guidance and opens the door for you to make the same application again the following year, addressing whatever you may have missed or what you misstated or what they said you needed to include. So. If you don't get funded, remember, on, on a typical competitive grant program today, out of every 100 that get funded, there are 150 that don't get funded. That's how competitive it is. And in many cases, um, it's they just ran out of money. But it never hurts to reach back to the federal agency and say, I appreciate the opportunity to apply. Could you help me understand what I could do better if I want to apply again? The other thing, I going back to a point that Julie made early on, there is extreme value in checking out websites of federal agencies that you're thinking of getting going after a grant, because increasingly over the past two or three years, federal agencies are listing 
the grants that are awarded. So if you're looking for a particular kind of grant in 24, and it was available in 23 and 22, that agency will now have a complete list of the awards. And in most cases, they will provide a summary of why the grant was awarded. That gives you tremendous intelligence and in understanding what the federal agency is looking for and the type of information that they require in order to get funded. Those are my parting words. Julie, do you have anything less? You're on mute. No, I think that that was a great summary, John. Um, I just went on camera in case anybody is at the uh, <clears throat> the, the winter conference. They'll they'll know who to look for. <laughs> uh, we will be there and be happy to help answer questions. There you go. And there's John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, thank you guys so much. As I, I'm already getting some good feedback, some requests for the recording, and some requests for the slides. So um, this has been very informative and we really appreciate everyone's time today. Those who joined the webinar and of course, John and Julie for presenting. Thank you Thank all. you very much. Our pleasure. I, I, um, I guess that'll wrap it up for today. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully we'll see you in a, next month in San Antonio.